Hi mamas, welcome to Mental Health Monday here with Detroit Moms and me, Carrie Biscalonis, owner of Reset Brain and Body, an integrative mental health care practice in Plymouth, Michigan, and also operating online throughout Michigan. So today, let's talk about some signs that it's time to ask for help. Now, I want to start the series talking about what is often discussed as high functioning anxiety or high functioning depression. And this is the phrase that a lot of people have almost worn as a badge of honor of, oh, it's okay. I just have like high functioning anxiety or high functioning depression, or um, it's just like a tiny little bit of disordered eating habits. Um, and this is a way that we've diminished what is actually a call for help in that you are deserving of being able to get some tools and resources and assistance in helping you with even these high functioning attributes. So let's back up and talk about what this actually looks like. So I wanna first target the physical symptoms of what might be depression or anxiety, but that perhaps you've normalized. So the first one is IBS or symptoms related to digestive issues or stomach aches, something that you notice either shows up with stress or with just a chronic type of state of being that you're in. And so again, this isn't necessarily normal. If you recognize that you have stomach cramps or have you know stomach issues, well, maybe it's something to look a little bit, little bit further into. We know that anxiety and depression, there is a really strong gut brain connection here. And so it's important to take note of those symptoms, migraines, headaches, shoulder pain, neck pain, back pain, all can be related to some sort of mental and emotional imbalance. Additionally, blood pressure, anything related to heart disease, inflammation in general, there's also a really strong connection to our mental and emotional health. Uh, that then relates to sometimes the development of fibromyalgia or other autoimmune disorders. When we're in a chronic state of stress, we are more inflamed because our immune system is fighting something that isn't actually there because it's our brain that's signaling that we're under distress and therefore it needs to do something. The body needs to fight and heal. And when we are fighting something that's not actually there, we're releasing free radicals. And these free radicals that aren't met with antioxidants then can create inflammation in the body. A chronic state of inflammation then creates a host of actual physical diseases. So this can be related back to Alzheimer's they've had a link to, certain cancers, and autoimmune immune disorders. So something to really note with how your physical body is responding. Also hormonal imbalances. So your period, your cycle should not be really that intense. You should have a healthy cycle. And if it's unhealthy, it's usually related to hormonal imbalances that are actually augmented by being stressed and having anxiety and depression in our system. Additionally, these can be augmented by our diet and lack of sleep, both of which can be then affected by our mood. Okay, so those are some of the physical ways in which anxiety, depression, other mental health issues show up that we may not be as attuned to. Mentally, what might anxiety or depression high functioning look like? So a lot of times, again, we use this as a badge of honor. I'm a perfectionist. I am high achieving. I just always have so many balls in the air. I can't sleep. I don't need to sleep. I only need four hours of sleep a night anyways, because, um, you know, that's just who I am. I'm always operating at this fast pace eventually you're going to burn out <laughs> or if you're not going to burn out mentally, physically because of that chronic state of stress, there are the things that are going to happen to your body that eventually are going to come through. Because a lot of times when we ignore the signs mentally, our body does not lie. Our body tries to do something to get our attention to say, whoa, slow down, heal, fix this. This is not okay. And that's when the physical symptoms show up. 
Ideally, we catch it before the physical symptoms get really loud and really destructive and impair your life. Okay, so things like being unable to focus, right? Not being able to concentrate, getting easily distracted, worrying. You guys, worrying <laughs> is not a acceptable constant state of mind. There's a certain amount of worrying that is inherent in being a parent. Yes, you have little kids or big kids. They are versions of you out there in the world facing risk. Absolutely, you're going to worry. But the obsessive worrying, the ruminating, what we talk about in mental health care, the inability to let go of a thought, and it just spirals. That is anxiety. And what's interesting is that when we constantly obsess and ruminate over negative or scary thoughts, usually then we spiral down into depression because then we're also coping in ways that aren't always healthy for us. I'll get to that in a second. So ruminating, worrying, obsessive thoughts, having scary thoughts, like thoughts like you know, this comes up a lot in postpartum thoughts like, oh, I just want to like throw my kid out the window. Okay, totally get it if that happens every once in a while. But if that's a thought that's constantly coming up and it actually feels like something you might want to do, that needs some attention. Additionally, a thought of self-harm, a thought of suicide, suicidal ideation, like, oh, I just wish I wasn't here anymore. Life would be so much better if I wasn't here. My whole family would be better off if I wasn't here. Those are serious thoughts. Those are those scary thoughts that we need to pay attention to. What else? Uh, being cynical, pessimistic. You know, we, we use this term of endearment, Debbie Downer, but look at those Debbie Downers you've had in your life. Were they actually struggling with depression? And we just ignored it and thought, oh, it was funny. Oh, Debbie Downer, or she's such a wet blanket. She never has any fun. Let's actually be taking a critical lens and wonder, oh gosh, I wonder if that person needs help or periods in our own life when we're like, wow, I'm not interested in anything. I'm pretty pessimistic. I'm always the one bringing down the mood. I seem to have a complaint about everything. Oh, wow, maybe you're depressed and it's okay to be depressed, okay? It's okay to have anxiety. It's okay to have postpartum depression. It's okay to have depression in general. This is just a way of giving you the tools to start recognizing it in yourself and in others so you know when to get help for yourself or encourage someone else to get help before it gets too bad. And again, before it turns into perhaps something physical. Okay, what else? Um, anger, irritability, lashing out. So we talked about anger two weeks ago and this one was such a hot topic because I think we can all really relate to that irritability. But when that irritability is constant, when we're angry all the time, when we have such a short fuse, there's usually something else going on. And a lot of times it's related back to some sort of dissatisfaction, the inability to get our needs met, of being sad and depressed and lonely and helpless and hopeless. We end up then reacting in anger. So again, anger, peel it back. Is there depression there? Um, forced happiness, right? Fake it till I make it. Okay, I'll just fake it till I make it. Just gotta get up and survive today. It might be a way in which you coach yourself. But if this is something that is chronically showing up every morning, like, okay, I just got to make it through today. Oh, I can't wait to get to tonight where I can just put my pajamas back on and go to bed. Again, there's usually something else there. So paying attention to it. Um, apathetic, disinterested in things that we normally be interested in, uh, say no to social obligations or just say no to friends and, and going out at all. Right now, I understand it's a little bit different, <laughs> but recognizing like, oh, wow, like I, I really like nothing's exciting me. I have nothing that is making me feel like I even want to leave my little cocoon. Okay, what, what else is there? Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Are you having social anxiety? You don't want to go out because you don't want to be judged from people. You're afraid of what you'll say. You're afraid of how you'll relate to people. You're afraid if people will like you. Those are all examples of what social anxiety might show up as. Being a perfectionist, again, this is something that a lot of times we wear as a badge of honor and thinking like, I'm just really, really productive and I'm detail oriented and I expect the best out of everyone. Okay, cool, but is that actually related to anxiety? Is it because you need the constant reassurance because you aren't able to let things go because you're constantly dwelling and obsessing over the facts? 
looking at it, perfectionism, is it actually anxiety? And then general guilt, right? That feeling of like, I'm never doing enough. I'm not enough. I'm a failure. I'm letting people down. And maybe that's showing up as people pleasing or relaxing your boundaries. Is that a sign of something else? Is that a sign of depression? Is that a sign of trauma that needs to be healed? Is it a sign of anxiety? Because we're constantly looking again for that reassurance and for someone to make us feel better about ourselves. Uh, in procrastination, right, that goes back to kind of the inability to focus, but then also just not being able to follow through on stuff because we're either afraid of letting someone else down, afraid of letting ourselves down, afraid of failure. Again, that can all show up as uh, symptoms of anxiety. All right, so those are some of the mental and emotional symptoms. Now I want to go to lifestyle factors. So changes in sleep, either inability to sleep or sleeping so much, inability to get out of bed, lack of desire to get out of bed. That could be a symptom of something else. Um, low sex drive, right? Sometimes I had, I had a doctor once that said, you know, maybe it's a relationship issue. Yeah, maybe. And maybe it's because your needs aren't being met. Maybe because there is a disconnect there. Maybe because your self-esteem is really low. Maybe because you're not taking care of yourself. Maybe because you're not eating or feeling your body enough. So recognizing that low sex drive might be a symptom of something else that needs to be processed through and, and worked on. Losing your temper, again, that anger, that irritability that shows up. Lack of appetite. So just complete disinterest in food, but also binging. Right, just the need to like fill yourself up with something to make yourself feel better, to make yourself feel grounded. If consumption, binging either with eating or with shopping or some other form of consumption feels therapeutic to you, well, there's usually something there. Why do you need that? What's going on there? How are you not coping effectively with something else? Numbing, escaping, avoiding. So I just want to get to the end of the day so I can lay in bed and watch Netflix all night. Or I just want to watch Christmas movies for the next weekend because I can't deal with anything else in my life. Everything feels like too much. Um, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to answer my phone. I don't want to text anyone back. I, I just need to escape. Um, or I need to go on a drive. And I need to leave my family for the weekend because I am so unhappy with how things are going. Again, these all are symptoms perhaps of something else. Um, the other one that I really want to talk about is disordered eating. So a lot of times we think in order to have an actual eating disorder, it means you are anorexic or bulimic, you know, the classic representations of not eating, being real thin, or, you know, binging and purging. Disordered eating can show up in really micro ways. And the way in which you view your body and talk about your body, the need for exercise, either as compensation or punishment, the restriction of calories as a way to have control when life feels chaotic, these are all disordered eating habits. And that usually is related back to some type of depression, trauma, anxiety that then needs to be worked on, processed through, and healed. Um, also, the inability to relax. How many people know people that just don't know how to relax, literally cannot sit still? It's usually because there's an undercurrent of anxiety there. Um, and then lastly, ticks, um, fidgeting, nervous habits. You know, what else is going on there? What are they ruminating, obsessing over? Okay, so physical, mental, and lifestyle symptoms that are usually indicative of an eating disorder, postpartum or perinatal mood disorder, depression, anxiety, or something else. If you have any other symptoms that you have seen in yourself or other people that would be helpful to spread more awareness about just mental health care, please drop it in the comments um, and share your own experiences or your experience of those around you. The more we know, the more we know, and then can take care of ourselves and other people. And that way then we are all hopefully better functioning, happier, more peaceful people, which is better for the world. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with me <laughs> or a little bit of it. And as always, visit us at resetbrainandbody.com for any additional resources or to book an appointment with one of our therapists. Thinking of all of you, have a great day.